All of the world is experienced through code. This is a statement that Marcus Merrill makes on today's episode, and it's absolutely true. See, even if you sell the most niche, handmade thing, you probably sell it online, which means someone's code is powering your business. And your buyers are experiencing your business through code. So the worst thing for your business is bad code because that makes for a bad experience. And I know what you're thinking, what if I don't write code? Well, if you're listening to this show, you're probably creating user experiences. And today, Marcus tells us how we can do it better. We should all listen. Our businesses depend on it. Look for these top takeaways in today's episode. How even if you sell products, physical products, you're interfacing with code. This is what the no code movement is based on. That as products are good and improving, they're not improving as fast as people's expectations and what we should do about it. And how to properly test your experiences, whether or not you write code. Now in Build Something More, we talk about the acquisition process from the acquirer's point of view as Marcus's company made an acquire uh, a an, an acquisition recently usually we get it from the perspective of the seller not the buyer so i'm excited about that to hear that and get ad free extended conversations of every episode of how i built it you can become a member over at joincreatorcrew.com it's just 50 bucks a year That's less than five bucks a month and you get those ad-free extended episodes. You get behind the scenes content, the weekly wrap, which is a bonus episode every week. And you get access to live stream archives and all of my workshops, which are usually 40 bucks a seat. Again, that's over at joincreatorcrew.com. This is episode 274, so you can find all of the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 274. Thanks to today's sponsors, Nexus and LearnDash. You'll hear about them later on in the show, but for now, let's get on to the intro and then the interview. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast that helps small business owners create engaging content that drives sales. Each week, I talk about how you can build good content faster to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. Marcus, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's great to be here, Joe. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, So in our pre-show, we were talking about how you have 20 years of experience um, in in QA and user experience specifically, but you started in the game industry. I thought that was really interesting. I was just telling somebody today that my favorite book, um, maybe the one one of the most impactful books for me is Masters of Doom. Uh, mm-hmm. which is all about ID software. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And that kind of want, made me want to be a developer, which, which, I mean, 20 years later, that, that book still has a big impact on me. Yeah, absolutely. I remember at some point there was a rumor that uh, Romero was going to visit the offices I worked at in Austin, Texas. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and if he ever came, I wasn't there that day, but it was just, he was this legendary game designer and, and it would have been great to, to see him. But yeah, it's a uh, it's small, small group uh, of, of folks that work in the industry and we generally know each other, but I never met Romero. <laughs> That's funny. He, yeah, he was kind of like the rock star of yeah. the pair, right? He was, uh, he was kind of like, I mean, I like try not to always talk about Apple, but like he was kind of the, the Steve Jobs to John Carmack's Steve Wozniak, I think, yeah. right? Where Carmack was like right. the brains of the operation. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Fun times. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about this because like I said, I think that um, from my experience as a developer myself, testing wasn't always my favorite thing to do in code because you're trying to basically break code that you just got working, um, which is probably why there's a separate QA people. Um, but then from a from a no code perspective, as somebody who's moved fully into the kind of creator space and helps people build their own platforms without code, I think testing might be even more important because now you're chaining a bunch of tools together, hoping that they work and testing 
could be pretty difficult. So, um, you, so Sauce Labs has this, sorry, my New York accent might come out from time to time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sauce Labs uh, has a, a white paper called Every Experience Matters. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the basis for the white paper is essentially that all of the world now is experienced through code, basically. Uh, if you sell a product and that product is, you know, uh, wooden stars that you put together on, on, you know, on your own and then you sell them online, at some point your product, no matter what you sell, is going to interface with code at some point and have to be packaged to be sold via code shipped logistically via code and then moved out to someone. So you can no longer really avoid being in this world of code and code is just as fragile as the humans who write it. So it's interesting. The point that you make around this low code concept of uh, no code, the WordPress kind of thing to me, that's really exciting because as you said, you probably can't just always innately trust that the components that are, are put together to make a WordPress site work are always tested perfectly. You can be reasonably confident, though, that, you know, they're they're probably in a decent state. What to me, the, the nice thing about that is that it gives you the ability to focus on your top priorities and your business and not just what I always have to do and had to do in my QA career, which is say, is that is that button actually a button? Is, does it does it work right? You know. You're probably going to be right, but now you can focus on am I are, are my users able to search for and buy my stuff? Am I showing up on Google the way I need to show up? You can test for that stuff now. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I mean, payment gate. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember trying to integrate payment gateways in a in oh. pre Stripe days, right, where oh, you yeah. couldn't just like plug in a button basically and have it work. Uh, you would need to. Uh, do some like wild handshake with either PayPal's, I think it was called IPN or, yeah. uh, or what was the authorized.net was like the, the big one that I'm sure like big corporations still Sounds use, right. but yeah, yeah <laughs> independent creators aren't really using that these days, but yeah, but you used to have to do the rest. So handshake the, yeah. the code to actually manage the API requests and stuff like that. And, uh, test all of that stuff at the same time. It was a nightmare. Yeah, and you know, it 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 gave me agita. I remember, um, what, God, I, first of all, I undercharged for this project because I had no idea what I was doing. But <laughs> this uh, nonprofit organization wanted to raffle off a million dollar house, uh, and so we set up PayPal to do it. And I didn't realize that raffling was considered gambling, um, and so PayPal like shut it down. Oh my. And they were like, well, we need to figure out a different way to do this. Like maybe we could just like store the credit card numbers and, and do the charge on our end. And I was like, well, no, we cannot do that. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I may be, I may not be the most experienced developer at this point, but I know that much. And, and so, you know, I think they ended up going with somebody who like kind of understood payment gateways better, but yeah. Regulation yeah. compliance, there's all sorts of stuff you don't want to have to mess with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm yeah. not PCI compliance or whatever. Right. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. um, yeah, so so I like what you said here. Even if you all the world is experienced through code, right? And that's even more. Um, I don't know, like what the expiration date on mentioning the pandemic is, uh, but <laughs> the pandemic really uh, accelerated that for a lot of businesses, right? Yeah. Businesses that still weren't online had to go online in order to yeah. to stay in business. Yeah, there's a famous comic. Uh, it's just a one panel where there's a people, a bunch of people in a boardroom in the tall building saying, yeah, maybe it's time to start talking about our digital transformation. And meanwhile, there's a wrecking ball right outside the window <laughs> called COVID-19. <laughs> it's, yeah, you are going to start talking about your yeah. digital transformation now. And what's what's interesting is that this, this uh, white paper we put out was survey-based, and we got some pretty strong indications that, uh, you know, products are good and they're improving, but they are not improving as fast as people's patience is deteriorating. Mm. So even as experiences overall get better and the market is shifting to, to having better quality practices and having better, you know, uh, basically gates in place to make sure that you can't ship bad software. Um, but at the same time, one in five people say they won't wait any amount of time for an error to be fixed. They're just going to go somewhere else. Wow. That's so interesting. Right. Because like yeah. the, like the common stat is like, 
like 80% of people will abandon a site if it takes uh, five seconds to load, right? But now you're absolutely right. I I almost bought something last night and I was having trouble um, Mm -hmm. and it was like a thousand dollar thing. And I was like, um, well, I mean, if this isn't working, <laughs> like, yeah. why would I shell out the money? And then, you know, I, I would have looked more into it on my computer, but I forgot I was putting my kids to bed and I forgot. Yeah, once uh, a couple a couple months ago, we were trying to close, uh, finally close on a house. And closing is in three days and I need to upload this bank statement. And I click the button to upload the documents and it just simply doesn't open any dialogue at all. And so what do I have to do? I have to try launching it in Safari and didn't work. Try launching it in Edge. Oh, well, that worked. And it's like, how, how is this still happening in 2022? Yeah. And, <laughs> and how are non-technical people supposed to, like, I mean, how many people have more than one browser installed on their computer? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I mean, I'm a web tester by trade. Right. So yeah, of course I have. But yeah, you, that, what a great point. How many people yeah. even have that? Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll check if something's not working. The first thing I do is disable my ad blocker. Yeah. Uh, and then if that's not working, I go, I use Safari usually. So I'll go to Chrome where things tend to work better anyway. Um, clear but cash. Yeah. Yeah. Clear <laughs> cash, all that stuff, which is like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I got my dad to watch the Yankee game a couple of weeks ago because it was on Amazon prime. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, I don't know how to do that. So I like talked him through like signing in on his Roku. And I'm like, that's a bad, that's a bad experience for baseball, for example, right? Mm-hmm. That is too mm-hmm. many steps to get people who are used to putting on channel 11 to mm-hmm. watch the game to then go and have to do that. Yeah. And even when you, you're lucky enough to have a TV that you could just dial into channel 11, for some reason it takes like 10 seconds for it to figure out whether or not it's working or not. <laughs> the audio doesn't come on for another five seconds after that. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just weird to me that, you know, we used to have this cable box with an up and arrow, up and down arrow and it just worked instantly. And now everyone has to, it has to go through multiple levels of filtering and processing in order to, to, to work at all. And now, now that that has gotten worse, we are also less patient. Yeah. That, which is, but uh, cause uh, I mean, so I haven't like prepped you on this question, but I am curious to hear your answer. Why do you think that is? Is it like my first thought is Amazon probably because like they made everything so fast and easy, but um, you know, maybe there's like some other, maybe people are just generally less patient because they're used to like fast internet connection. I I think that's, that's gotta be it. You know, um, we're spoiled enough, I think by the good experiences to, not tolerate the bad ones. Yeah. And, you know, so if you're not, if you're not putting as much effort into the Amazon, the the experience as Amazon is or Uber or something like that, one of those big companies where the stuff just seems to always work, then, you know, you you really, you really have to, because I mean, the statistics we see on this are just, I mean, 25% of users will leave a negative review. Half of them will tell friends and relatives. And this mm. is all, you know, survey information from very recently. Like if you, if you don't get it right, you're, you're probably going to lose that customer because there is too much choice in this market not to be able to. I mean, I, what I wonder is how many apps are on everyone's phone that have been used only once because the first time you try to launch it, you have to go through two or three factor authentication. Then you have to go through the identifying the truck on Google mm-hmm. or I did, you know, which <laughs> of these tiles is a crossroad. Yeah. So much pressure, right? Is that little white spot part or traffic light is always, does the pole count as part of the traffic light? Exactly. And so, and then, and the problem there is that you don't even control that as a software developer. You're letting Google come in and step in and step all over your, your user experience in order to authenticate you as not a bot. But if you don't do it, you might have bots all over the place. So yeah, we're, we're, I think we're losing patience because we do have some stuff that does work that well, but we're limited then in our choices. And so we're hoping that everyone comes along and, and, and gets that good. Yeah. And that's you, kind of what sauce is trying to help with. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's so funny too, because it does, it really does happen quickly. Now, if an app, if I download an app on my iPhone and it doesn't have sign in with Apple, I'm not going to create an account. Yeah. Like you want me to type my name and email address and a password on my phone when I, when I should just be able to push a button yeah. like six months ago, that's just how everybody did it. But then Apple was like, no, we're making it really easy. 
Um, and so that's, that's, and, and to your point, right, that is something that is available via API, just like, um, I make sure to have like the Apple and Google pay buttons on my shopping carts because yeah. I get annoyed when they don't exist on yeah. a shopping cart I try to use. I'm gonna punch in a credit card number by by hand or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I mean, and again, like apps try to make it easier, right? A- Apple has their keychain and and one password mm-hmm. stores uh credit card information. But again, how many how many non technical users trust or know that? Right. And really where it gets to be bad is, I mean, we're here talking about stuff like I can't order a rake on time, but even, but when it gets to stuff that's critical, Mm -hmm. government services, health insurance, and then you, you know, that's where, you know, if something goes wrong, you might be at real risk of losing something or not getting something accomplished that you desperately need to get accomplished. And then you add to that the fact that 15% of people who use the internet require assistive technology for disabilities that they've got, visual, hearing, uh, cognitive, neurodivergent. And 60% of those people who need assistive technology, I'm actually one if you consider glasses to be, um, they kind of have no recourse because they are unable on a daily basis to get a given task done. And so, you know, to me, if you want to talk about how bad code costs you, uh, one of the great frontiers of revenue growth would be invest in making your site accessible. Because right now there's a chance if you haven't put any thought into it, you've already excluded something like 15% of your audience. You add that in and your competitors don't, suddenly your audience grows. Yeah, you know, I've been beating that drum with podcast transcripts a lot. Mm, um, yeah. Because there are people who cannot listen to podcasts and... By adding the trend, yes, that's a real tangible cost, sure. But I've increased my my consumership, my you know, listenership. I guess, listenership. <laughs> yeah, I've increased the people who can consume the podcast by adding transcripts. Um, and I yeah. I definitely saw a a bump in strangely downloads um, when I added transcripts several years ago. So I think yeah. that's a great point. I talk uh, at length. Uh, with Amber Hines about accessibility. So I'll link her episode in the show notes, which you'll Great. be able to find at how I built that it slash two seven four. Um, there's uh there's one more point I want to make here before we kind of move on to hopefully we've convinced people at this point, right. That they, they need to make sure that they, I mean, when we say bad code, right. We're really, we, we, are talking about a bad experience, whether it's your code or someone else's code. Or even um, design, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, my, You mentioned when something's critical, my brother-in-law, when he got married, uh, his wife is, is self-employed. When, when he got married, they had to go through some sort of rigmarole to get her on, on his insurance. Uh, and the website failed and the paperwork would never went through and she was without insurance for an amount of time because of it. Mm. Like that's, that is critical. Like that's, it could be life threatening. Yeah, absolutely. And what if you don't have a smartphone? What if you don't have a laptop? Yeah. You cannot assume that everyone has the access to these, these kinds of technology to be able to, to get that. You need to be able to do it from a library or some terminal or something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly right. Have you read um, Eric Meyer's book? And the title is escaping me right now. I probably should have brought it up. I'm going to well, say no based on the name of the author. <laughs> okay, he, uh, it's it's um, it's basically a book about uh, like designing in crisis. It might be mm-hmm. called that, but Interesting. Um, his his daughter sadly uh, passed away from uh, a, a rare form of cancer, and when when they, before they knew uh, they had to get to the hospital. And so they're like in the car looking for critical information on a hospital site and they couldn't find it. Like the site was so poorly designed that they couldn't even find like the address Mm -hmm. to get to the hospital. Um, And so stuff like, I mean, you don't, nobody designed for real life is what it's called. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll link yeah. that okay. in the show notes too. But yeah. you know, it's not stuff you necessarily want to have to think about. And maybe my my membership it, most would not consider that 
life critical, but if you're making websites or you're helping people make websites, like those are things you need to think about. What's the most important information for somebody who is going to the hospital? Yeah. And maybe they're distressed. Yeah. I mean, uh, we always encourage people to take their app on the road, take it out. Um, you know, we have one, one customer, a prominent bank in, in America who tells us that they routinely send people into the New York City subway to see how their app acts under duress in, you know, constant cell phone tower changes and connections, disconnections. It's not that the app is expected to always work perfectly every time, but that under duress, it will at least let you know, can't do this right now. There's something in the way. There's an interruption. At least give you the feedback to know, okay, we, you know, we either can't process this, this work right now, or we process this in a queue and we'll send it later, something like that. Because I've, I've worked on some apps, um, one theme park app I've, I've used before where you, you know, you're walking around and you don't really understand if the thing you're trying to do is working or not. You feel like mm -hmm. the app is responding, but it's not actually telling you. And then you figure out that your food order got lost, you know, in some packet right. shuffle cause you were on a ride and lost your cell phone tower. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, that's, that's so interesting. I love that because it's, it's, it's also about like kind of failing gracefully, right? I think there's yeah. like the, the common story of the Instagram app where if you like something, it'll store that like on your device if it's not connected to the internet. So it's like yeah. still positive reinforcement mm -hmm. and then it'll handle it in the background. Yeah, I, I, I later, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like to do this. I'm, I love going to Disney world. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. my brother works there and I will like to open up the app and look at like the wait times it's saying and then compare it to the wait times oh, around yeah, the yeah, park. Yeah. Really accurate. So nice work, Disney, yeah. I guess. Uh, their their um, app is fantastic. Yeah, right? It really is. Um, yeah. And on, on that same token, I was developing like a Star Tours tracker, like because you can get like, I, I think it's over 60 combinations now. Yeah, that's right. I think. And I wanted to keep track, but it was like a web-based thing. And I was like, yeah, but like, what if people don't have internet connection, right? So then I started looking into like local storage using JavaScript and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's, it's stuff that if, like you said, if you are using the app, I would have never thought about that if I hadn't tried to log a ride yeah. right after right. getting off the ride, right? Right. Um, it's so, interesting. One of the, uh, sorry, one of the things we're, we're, I'm really excited about is that we, you know, bug reports are really hard for a QA person, you know, for a non QA person, especially to say, here's what I was doing. Here's the product. Here's, here's the steps I went through before this thing didn't work. And that's why I'm really happy with, with one of the companies that we acquired uh, last year that, that sort of allows you to put an app in the field and then submit that kind of a bug report with all this extra information and telemetry and steps to reproduce all that stuff. So that's it's really great. That's awesome. And and for those who are interested uh, in Build Something More, our members only portion of the episode, uh, Marcus and I are going to talk about acquisitions from the acquirer side. On this show, I've talked to acquired people, um, but I haven't talked to an acquirer. So if you're interested in that, you can join the creator crew. You'll get ad-free extended episodes of this and every episode of the podcast. Uh, and that's going to be over at howibuilt.it slash 274. Um Bug reports are really hard. I create a template for when I was doing client work. That's basically, I was using this device yeah. with this browser yeah. at this time. I tried to do this. I expected this and this happened. Yeah. And what we try to do is say, um, here's, here are the 10 things the user did on the device before mm. they submitted a bug report. And then here is the log from within oh. the device itself. And yeah. here are all the HTTP requests that it tried to make at the time. And maybe there was an API failure in there. And, uh, you know, all that sorts of stuff about status around where the battery was and, and, and just all that. So that so they could fill in all the blanks that the developer is naturally going to ask once yeah. you submit the bug report. Also, it includes like a 10-second video, I think, of, of the, the last 10 seconds before the bug was submitted. So, yeah. This episode is brought to you by LearnDash. Look, I've been making courses for a long time. I've taught at the college level and I've created curriculums for several different organizations, including Udemy, Sessions College, and LinkedIn Learning. When I create my own courses, there's no better option than LearnDash. LearnDash combines cutting edge e-learning tools with WordPress. They're trusted to power learning programs for major universities, small to mid-sized companies, startups, and creators worldwide. 
What makes Learn Dash so great is it was created by and is run by people who deeply understand online learning and adds features that are truly helpful for independent course creators. I love the user experience. And now you can import Vimeo and YouTube playlists and have a course created automatically in seconds. I trust LearnDash to run my courses and membership, and you should too. Learn more at howibuilt.it slash LearnDash. Let's see if we can apply this information as a creator, uh, as a small business owner. Maybe they're thinking, well, this is great, but I'm not a developer you know, I'm using a tool like ConvertKit to sell my products. I assume they've tested it. So, so what should I be doing? Yeah, well, well, I think that it's possible that you know everything's fine and they have tested it. But there are a couple things that I would watch out for. So, I think in general, there's some stuff I would watch out for. Then there's some stuff that I would think, yeah, that probably is covered. And then there's the stuff that you definitely need to make sure you keep testing. So. What I think you should be comfortable with is that if you have a, you know, just a simple web form element, button, text field, uh, you know, and, and you're trying to put together a workflow or some sort of a list of items that you're trying to sell. I don't know a typical, typical example of, a, of, a, of the kind of flow you're talking about here, but if it's like a, an online retail site, I don't know if that's a good example or not. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Let's say somebody's signing up for a membership. Yeah, so there's a really good chance that, you know, the login's going to work. The, you, you should test it. But like, once you've tested it a couple times, I don't think I would build like a whole suite of automation around making sure that the login works. Right. Stuff that you are, it, it, I would say that if it's anything that you're confident that 90% of that provider's other customers are doing, it's probably mm. in good shape. Yeah. If you're trying to combine things in a way that you think is probably net new or if you have to customize any of it, then that's where you would probably think, you know what? These things change in the background and they release new versions of it all the time. It's a cloud provider. It's a, so- a software as a service, which means you don't control when the versions get shipped. They don't get packaged up. You're, they're going to change stuff in your background all the time. So I want to make sure that my stuff continues to work. Um, and so once in a while, I'll, I'll run an automated test, especially if I have any amount of customization in there. Because if I have customization, there's a chance that the, the, you know, the, what we call the API contract might be broken with mm-hmm. the back end service. And I can explain that if you, if you think I should, um, the uh, main thing, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah. I was just gonna say, let's, let's, yeah, let's go through this and then maybe we could talk a yeah, little sure. bit about that. Cause I also want to ask you about some automated testing tools. Sure. Great. So the thing that I would definitely test at least a few times is what, what I think we agreed was called the user analytics. Mm-hmm. So at my previous employer, it was an e-commerce site, very, very large e-commerce site. And we relied extensively on user analytics to do three different things. Tell us, one of them was essentially tell us, describe to us what the user's actually doing on our site. The second one was to help us understand the SEO, Google search engine optimization, success and failures that we were having so that we could get a heads up on problems with SEO before Google could tell them about us. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was attribution for affiliate links. We made our money by sending our customers to uh, websites like Macy's or, or um, you know, a retail site, and we would send them with a coupon code, we would drop a cookie that would give us attribution so that we got 6% of the sale or whatever the commission was. Right. And then one day I did all this work in, in kind of a way I was thinking, okay, I'll just test to make sure all these analytics events are being sent when we think they're being sent. And then I found out that something like one out of seven because it was in this position on the page and it was in Chrome. And it was if it was on a Tuesday at 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> you know, if you clicked on it a certain way, it simply wouldn't get sent. And like one mm. out of seven of our code paths simply were not dropping the right attribution. And the funny thing is, it was providing a fine user experience. The user did not notice a difference, but we weren't getting paid wow. on something like one-seventh of our transactions. And it was wow. shocking. Yeah, it's so, not like li- that literally costs you money. <laughs> yeah, literally costs us money. So yeah. it's not just protecting the user experience because it's it, in a way it is protecting the user experience because those user events didn't couldn't feed into our sorting algorithms, prioritization mm-hmm. algorithms, SEO algorithms. We were not able to actually accurately describe what was going on with the customer at the time. So testing analytics 
even if you're with a WordPress, a no-code, a low-code site, making certain that those analytics events are exactly what they should be is crucial. Yeah. And I, I have a, I mean, I wasn't losing like one seventh of my revenue, but I have a similar story where um, I chained a couple of tools together. I was using a form builder in WordPress uh, because I didn't like convert kits native forms. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, using uh, a, a form in WordPress to send the form that was filled out to Zapier and yep. then Zapier would send that information to ConvertKit. So if anybody wanted to join my mailing list, they would fill out this native WordPress form, which I thought looked nicer. Uh, and then presumably their information would get sent to ConvertKit. And I noticed that for like two weeks, not a single person signed up for my mailing list. And I'm not getting a ton of people on my mailing list every day, uh, but uh, nothing zero. over a two week span raised a flag. And I was, I think I was testing the zap or there was something in the WordPress side that got turned off. And so people were filling out the form and it looked good to them. The form was quote unquote submitted, but the zap was never firing. And um, mm -hmm. I, because I'm a big dummy, didn't have a backup where the, like the information was also getting submitted to WordPress. Yeah, I was like, this works, right? So um, checking those analytics and, and testing to make sure um, is really important. And I would also say, if you're making forms in WordPress, just like always store the form submission. I'm not a lawyer. I don't really understand GDPR, but do the <laughs> things that you need to do for GDPR if you need to do things for GDPR. But yeah, yeah. Good, good point. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Storing PII. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned um, some automated. Well, actually, let me uh, let's back up for a minute. Um, one thing that probably should always be tested is payment gateways. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess my question around this is, what is what is a good way to test kind of payment processing, right? Like Stripe offers the test mode. Is that good enough? Should I do a, like a real $1 transaction with an actual credit card? Because that's like people are submitting. Like that can also literally cost you money if the payment gateway is not working. Right, right. Or if you do something like I can imagine making a mistake and saying, all right, we're going to run our test automation on every single commit and people do a thousand commits and you realize, oh, I didn't turn off that $1 test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, this, this answer might be a little bit nuanced and maybe a little bit complicated, but what I would say is your job is not to test PayPal. You, you, their software either works or it doesn't, it's either down mm -hmm. or it's not. PayPal has published an API that is a contract to you. That contract has a list of endpoints, a list of data types that it accepts, and then a body that it returns to let you know whether it's succeeded or not. Your job is not to test that. Your job is to understand whether your software knows how to communicate with that contract or not. So what I would recommend in those cases is, yes, do your test mode testing when you, you know, once in a while. Mm -hmm. But mostly for, I'd say for 90% of the test cases you need, test against a mock endpoint. Okay. That make sure that you know that your software can absolutely communicate with that payment gateway 100%. And if that gateway is taking eight seconds to respond one day and you have 500 tests that use it, then that's going to be 500 tests times eight extra seconds for each test that has to run. Mm -hmm. If you mock out the endpoint, then it'll return in 0.1 seconds and you'll be certain that your software knows how to deal with PayPal. And then you have a few tests that just say, okay, we know that our software knows how to communicate with that contract. Now let's make sure that it's actually working right now with the contract. Yeah. So that's what I would say. It's a kind of a complicated answer, but it's, it's the way you can, you can reasonably ship software with confidence and not have to worry about, oh, pay, the payment gateways test site is down right now. I can't do anything. Right, you right. Know? Yeah, and I mean, that makes sense. And that's like all the more reason to use tools that, yeah. um, you know, like WooCommerce, for example, you can reasonably assume that WooCommerce uh, and e-commerce software for, for WordPress knows how to communicate with PayPal and Stripe, yeah. like it's built in. And, and so, yeah. um, but then to, to your point earlier, like if you're doing 
if you're doing more nuanced stuff, right? Like one example is uh, I I was using WP Simple Pay, which allows you to add just like these really simple Stripe buttons to your site for like simple one-off transactions. It's not a um, it's not a shopping cart, so people would just click the button and pay the amount. Um, and I had some metadata that I just assumed was getting sent to Stripe. Mm-hmm. So that it would kick off again a Zapier automation to get them into like this customer flow, um, but that metadata, I had to explicitly uh, send it to Stripe using the plugin or something like that. Like it wasn't getting sent at first, mm, um, yeah. and so that's the kind of testing. Uh, like I knew that the money would get captured, uh, but and that's like maybe the most important part. But like the second most important part. Um, or the most important part to the user is their good experience, right? If they're not getting that initial, like for a coaching program, that initial email saying, hey, thanks for paying, grab a time on my calendar because mm. the the automation associated with the payment is broken. Like that's that's on me. And now the person who just paid me like $1,000 is is already having a bad experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So- yeah, I mean, there's there is where you need kind of a confederacy of tools, uh, but I think making sure that the metadata gets sent, you know, it's 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 a little bit difficult to do that in an automated fashion, but it certainly is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, in the, in the past, you you would always have had to use something like a proxy or or network tools in order to be able to make sure that the HTTP request is yeah. being sent properly. Right. Um, at Sauce, we have tooling that allows you to sort of download all the HTTP activity generated by the app that you're trying to test. We have nice. that now on, on mobile devices. In fact, if you just run a test session with the right things enabled, you'll get a HAR file at the end of it that tells you everything that happened. Nice. Um, that that feature is only three weeks old, so I'm super oh, excited wow. about it. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah, in the past you would have to hook up something like Charles Proxy or Browser Mob or something like that, and now we just yeah. sort of offer it to you natively, which is That's great. That's great. Um, There's also, what's that? Uh, there There is a like a Mac app that tests APIs. I want to say it's called Mailman or something like that, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. Gosh, but I don't it, remember. Like tests APIs, yeah. Um, I'll try to find it for yeah. the show notes. I can't remember right now. Yeah, and there's and there's a bunch of free free tools on the market. I think um there's I mean if you if you're into coding, there's um rest assured is the a really nice. nice Java library for um for testing APIs. It's what I used before um I discovered some of the other some of the commercial tools that I think uh, make me have to do less work. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So, so let's talk about maybe, let's say um, there's a a creator who's like not really technical. Uh, are there are there tools for them where they can kind of get an idea of of like a user experience um, without kind of digging into like these API contracts that we're talking about? Well, I mean, it's tough for the API contract stuff. I don't know of an easy way. Unless maybe, I mean, so small creators probably wouldn't be using Adobe Analytics, but I know that Adobe <laughs> Analytics has a lot of good tools for making sure that these things are done right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it definitely is a little bit tough for this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. That's where I would probably try to get maybe a few hours of consulting time from some professional yeah. tester, because I don't know if I know of an easy way to just do that. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah. tough. That almost feels like it needs a real person. What about like the yeah. front end stuff, right? Because there, yeah. there's certainly front end testing tools. Um, yeah. Hotjar maybe is it's not really testing, but it gives me insight into how the user is using my site. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know that yeah. tool honestly. Oh, Actually. it's pretty neat. Yeah. It's like you install a little bit of JavaScript on your site, and then it uh, records. Um, User, uh, assuming they accept cookies, um, it kind of records their their session, so you could see like how long they spend, how much time they spend on the page, and then you could see what they click and where they're going to, and then where they exit. Um, it's it's pretty neat though, and then it, it can generate a heat map for you of of the most. Man, I am yeah. sold on this tool. I'm already looking at the website. Yeah, it looks it looks really good. That's Hotjar. If you're listening, sponsor this podcast. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, and they don't really compete with us, so that that looks pretty great. Nice. Um, it's really. I am all about user user behavior, actual user behavior. I'm definitely going to be looking at this, and I know that there's a couple of others. There's one called uh, um, the is a data dog. That that sounds like there's I've, there's another one. I'm yeah. not full story is the other one I'm thinking of that I think is more oh, of an enterprise nice. level enterprise level. But yeah, what what 
you know, one thing I've observed in my my shift over the last 20 years in QA is I used to spend all of my time trying to say, have I covered all the use cases? Have I mm-hmm. covered everything? Have I exercised every piece of the software to make sure that I've executed every single line of code to make sure that I know I can say that this product works as designed. And over the last 20 years, as I've evolved, and I think the industry has very much evolved to a point of saying, rather than let's make sure that the product works as designed, let's make sure the product works the way it should work for the betterment of our users to the point of hot jar. But furthermore, yeah. we're, we're shifting from a concept of asking, does it work? To a point of saying, have we covered our risk the most? Mm. So what I'm encouraging people to do these days, and I could tell you a story about this also. When yeah. I was I was very proud at one point, I had a team of offshore developers and they did a great job. I went on vacation and I said, automate everything to do with the user profile page while I'm gone. And I went away and I came back a week later and they said, we did 200 Selenium test cases dealing with the user profile page. So now if you can edit your 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 user profile, you can change your avatar, you can change your name, you can change your zip code, and now, and the analytics all work. We've written 200 Selenium tests, this stuff works, it's stable, they're green and everything. And I was so happy about this. I went back and I was talking to someone in business intelligence, the BI group, at lunchtime, and I said, we just spent a week auditing, you know, making sure that we could do 200 use cases. And the person from BI said, less than 1% of our users ever go to that area of the site. Oh, wow. Why in the world would you spend that much effort on that part of the site that nobody cares about that will not generate a dime of revenue? Wow. That conversation changed my career. Yeah, that's and that I mean sp- spend your time wisely is kind of the uh yeah. the thesis of this whole episode, right? You want to yeah. make sure that you're doing the things to create the best experience for both you yeah. and your users. That means um, if you're a retail yeah. site, you need to test to make sure that your search search engine lands you at the right place, that the top coupons are at the top, that the experience of getting someone through a checkout flow is flawless. And if you do that, that's probably 90% of your revenue. Oh, man, I love that. <laughs> and that, may, I mean, I have, a, uh, I have a, a story about that where for a while on my membership site, uh, members... This is one of the things like I, I just assumed the software worked as I expected it to work. Yeah. Um, but I had it when someone signed up for a membership, uh, they would get access to all of my courses. And then separately, I had an automation that would email them whenever they were enrolled in a course. And since the membership plugin was different from the LMS at the time, Mm-hmm. Uh, the membership plugin would auto enroll them in all the courses, which would trigger that automation for every course. And it wasn't until, I don't know, like 10 or 12 members did it that someone finally emailed me and was like, Hey, did you know I'm getting like 12 emails? And I'm like, no, nope, had no idea. <laughs> so I basically killed all those auto enroll emails and set up one through convert kit, which is now where all of my emails come <laughs> from. Um, that says, Hey, you have access to all the courses. You can yeah. access all of those courses here. Yeah. Yeah. But, you got to protect that experience. Yeah. You got to, and, and my friend, uh, Titus Fortner, he's a, he's a big test influencer. He might be have someone to talk to one day. Nice. He always, he says, test what the money wants. This episode is brought to you by store builder from Nexus. When it comes to setting up an e-commerce site, you have a choice between easy, but limited or a limitless platform that you need to manage yourself until now. Store Builder is e-commerce made easy for everybody. It saves you time and delivers a storefront that lets you get to selling. As someone who set up multiple e-commerce sites, I can tell you that Store Builder has been a much easier experience than anything else. Answer a few questions, add your content, and sell. Store Builder was created and is supported by e-commerce experts at Nexus. Get the speed, security, and support you need when you need it. Are you ready to launch your perfect online store? Head over to howibuilt.it slash storebuilder for a special offer. That's howibuilt.it slash storebuilder. Let's wrap up with maybe this question, right? We've ta- You have a, your own set of tools. I've talked about kind of building my own WordPress tools. Um, 
and maybe maybe this has already been covered, but let's say somebody is using a site like Etsy to sell. Um, is there something that that they can do to make sure they're offering the best experience to their users? Etsy is a pretty well established store, but maybe you know I think that's something that usually falls to the wayside is like the emails that go out. Um, yeah. Should people be like customizing those? Should they be um, mindful of something that they don't might not see as like the store? owner that the customer will always see? Yeah, you know, it, it's hard for me to say. That that actually yeah. falls into the realm of, you know, the real business expertise. Yeah. What I would say, what I would just encourage people to really pay attention to the reports that you get out of Etsy mm-hmm. around how things land. And, and there's probably all sorts of stuff you could do to make sure that you show up in search a little bit better. Yeah. That kind of a thing. I don't know if there's really, you know, technically QA to be done on something like that. But certainly there's ways you can go about optimizing the experience and making sure that, you know, the, the best Etsy stuff that I've, Etsy, best Etsy, Etsy experiences I've had have been ones where the, the um, owner has been very responsive and very mm. uh, interactive and engaging and positive and that kind of thing. And that goes under, I would think, common sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so I would, I would think there's a lot more variability in something like WordPress where it's basically a blank slate Right. And and that's where that's where there's a lot more variability and you do control the workflows, even though you probably have a template, there's probably at some point gonna be some way in which you diverge from what other people are doing. That's where you really want to make sure that you have you know, hallway testing is, is a phrase that I think maybe maybe has survived the pandemic. Um, but grab someone from the hallway, grab, you know, your 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 mother. I always try to have, you know, my mother or father check over something like that to say, look, can, can, can it just, can you just, can you get through the flow? Can mm. you do this? Cause if you can't, I, I am not objective. I've been doing web stuff for 20 years. Right. I can't just, you know, assume that I, my experience is the only experience. So hallway testing, grab someone. <laughs> that's, that's such a great tip, right? Um, I usually will test on behalf of my wife, but testing on behalf of my wife is not testing for my, my testing, my wife testing, I should say. Yeah. Um, so that's, that I think is such a great point, no matter what system you use. But uh, yeah, that email example definitely came from my experience with WordPress where like, yeah. again, I have WooCommerce, I had LearnDash, I have ConvertKit. All of these things are sending emails. Mm-hmm. And so uh, how do you control that experience? Well, WooCommerce doesn't really do a great job of, of helping you control those emails. You could get a paid or premium plugin, mm. or you can turn those emails off and manage it all through ConvertKit, right? Where there's ConvertKit integrates with WooCommerce, you send purchase data and email and then you could tag them as such and you can add them to a welcome purchase sequence and stuff like that. So, but that, well, that all goes to thinking about the experience. Well, I can tell you one, one little technical tip I've learned somewhat recently yeah. that I think could help at least with testing email flow is there's a trick in Gmail. I don't know if you know about this trick that you can use a plus sign inside your alias. Do you know that trick? I know that trick, but yeah. I don't know if so I've said it on the show. What, what I'll do is, you know, my my uh, email address, I don't mind giving it out, whatever, is uh, M-M-E-R-R-E-L-L at gmail.com. But if I say M Merrill plus one, two, three, four, on WooCommerce, that would take me as a separate user. But Gmail treats everything before the plus sign as the alias. Yeah. So you can have a, a r- roughly infinite number of email different email addresses for for the site that will always go to your inbox so you can test the flow as many times as you want using the plus sign hack and then all you need to do is make sure you keep track of which test case was which thing that came after the plus sign yeah that's great and that may that's really cool right because you could do like you know t- t- test and then a timestamp or whatever right if you're yeah. testing across multiple days that's really today and then test your your your, your multi-day workflow for something like a marketo something yeah. like that yeah Oh, that's that's super cool. Um, that's such a great. I'm, I'm going to treat that as the trade secret. I usually ask if you yeah. have a trade secret for us. I'm treating that because okay, that's that's <laughs> a really good tip. Um, let's let's wrap up here with. Uh, I mean, we we haven't really 
I mean, if someone's listening to this, right, I've mentioned what Sauce Labs does in the beginning, but um, let's kind of get it in context. Uh, because you've mentioned, I think you mentioned Selenium, you mentioned in our pre-show that you would do user interface testing, which I know of tools, I think like Casper that might do that sort of thing. I think that's like a JavaScript library where it like simulates user interactions um, and you can write those tests. But what is what exactly does Sauce Labs do and how can that help creators? Well, so if you're, so Sauce Labs is trying to sort of help people enter the field of test or, or ensure a good user experience every time. So we're trying to provide testing at all stages of the software development li- uh, life cycle. So if you have, we started off with Selenium. So if you had a set of Selenium tests that did automated UI testing, then we would say, well, you can only run those once at a time on your, your own machine. You run, you know, if you have 50 tests, that means you have to run all 50 one at a time on Chrome. And then you have all 50 one at a time on Firefox and all 50 one at a time on, you know, Safari. What we do is we provide the infrastructure to say, you can actually run all 50 of those at the same time in parallel on Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Edge all at once. So instead of wow. taking you know four hours to test, you could test theoretically in about five minutes because you could just do all of it in parallel. And then as the company evolved, we started offering other kinds of testing platforms, our frameworks like Cypress, Puppeteer, Playwright, Test Cafe, the JavaScript frameworks. We also offer mobile devices. So if you want to do your app testing web or native app, We offer any number of iPhones, Android devices, all sorts of stuff like you could run. If you need to make sure that you're supporting iPhone 7 users because you, you know, say, I I think there's, there's an interesting thing to be said about knowing your audience. If you work for something in healthcare, there's a fair chance that that you have maybe an older population that might have older technology and you can't Mm -hmm. always get a hold of of an iPhone 6. Right, right. And we've got plenty that you can use on older versions of iOS. So that's the kind of thing. If you need to test for device diversification, that is hard to get a hold of. You don't want to buy 50 devices and have them in a rack and have to keep right. charge of the batteries and the power supply. And my brother borrowed that one the other day and he <laughs> logged in as his own. So you don't want to mess with that. So we provide that kind of infrastructure. And lately we've been getting into other kinds of testing as well, like API testing and this, this field beta testing like I talked about. Later. That's great. And such a great resource too. When I when I wrote my book, Responsive Design for WordPress, I had a whole chapter on testing and I was basically like, well, like device labs exist depending on where you live. Um, browser stack exists if you're willing to pay. You could go to the AT&T store and load your website up on all of the phones there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, right. I, I, I'm, I've done that before. And so like I left and like a bunch of phones just had my personal website up on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, being able to do this, being able to do this in an automated way is A, uh, saves you time. Um, B, makes it more thorough and makes it more consistent, right? Mm-hmm. Because... Um, you know, maybe I phone in the last couple of tests because I'm tired of testing <laughs> and I'm yeah. just like, oh my, uh, yes. clickety click, right? Yeah, I tested this button a million times. Yeah. Surely it also works in Edge, right? Yeah. So, yeah, right. And that, that happens so much. And then, especially once you start getting into analytics testing, oh my God, it's, yeah. it's the most tedious thing in the world, but it's so important. You can't skip it. So, when I, when I was at my, my last job at retail, uh, the e commerce company, um, we had, Rooms full of people tapping and clicking and hooking up to proxies and watching HTTP logs and saying, okay, the events all went out as scheduled. It's like, okay, did you check all the key value pairs? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, Uh, automation, you know, there's certain things you should not automate, but there's certain things you should absolutely automate. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll I'll, I'll end on this thought because uh, I tried to sign up for a, a very a big company's service recently, like they offer like a very expensive enterprise option, right? And they're very well known. Uh, and they didn't accept American Express. Uh, so this was a disconnect. And, but they didn't, t- I had to like reach out to support for confirmation, yeah. right? So two failures here. One was that the error code I was getting was payment cannot be processed. It wasn't like you're using an Amex and we don't accept Amex. Two, 
I think any place, maybe I'm like calling you out. I hope I'm not. I think any place that offers an enterprise solution should absolutely offer, uh, accept uh, American Express because I feel like at least in the, maybe this is a very United States centric thing to say, but I'm going to say most big companies have a company card that is an Amex card. I, yeah. I don't think, I, I think that's a fair assumption. I, I, it's my experience. Uh, yeah. The only places I feel like have I've run across that haven't taken it recently are government related, like license plate <laughs> registration, stuff like that. But, but I mean, even then they're coming around. Yeah. So that's right. surprising I, to me. My, my former web host didn't accept it on their website. So like every time I came up for renewal, I'd have to like reach out to them and do like some weird, I'm like, this is annoying. And then I realized points of friction you put in the way of people get to do their job, man. Yeah. They want, they want to give you their money. That's the thing. They're sitting out there waiting for you to give them their money. That's exactly right. This is what I say. I'm like, how can I pay you? You can, however you prefer to pay me is how you can pay me. If people are trying to give you money, make it as easy as possible for them to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Marcus, this has been fantastic. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about acquisitions from the acquirer's point of view in Build Something More. Uh, You can find everything we talked about, including a way to become a member over uh, in the show notes at howibuilt.it slash 274. Joining the creator crew, by the way, is 50 bucks a year. That's less than five bucks a month. I paid $6 for an iced coffee today. So um, less than five bucks a month, $5 or $6 for an iced coffee that I finished in a few minutes. Um, You determine the value. But Marcus, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today. Sure. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Joe. And uh, last question, because I lost it in my massive notes document here. Where can people find you? (laughs) Uh, find me. Uh, I am at M M E R R E L L at M Merrill on Twitter. I don't do much on Twitter. I mostly retweet other people. Um, and also uh, I'm on LinkedIn somewhere as just Marcus Merrill, my, my name. Uh, and then saucelabs.com. Fantastic. I will link to all of that as well in the show notes. Again, over at How I Built That, it's slash 274. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to this week's sponsors. And until next time. Get out there and build something.